hello and welcome to the third video on processors, input, output, and storage devices. Today, I feel the need, the need for speed. We're going to be looking at CPU performance. There are many ways we can improve CPU proof. I'm getting tongue twisted already. Apologies for that. There are many ways that we can improve CPU performance. The key factors you need to know about at this level are clock speed, cache memory, and multiple cores. We're also going to look at a way of improving CPU efficiency known as pipelining. So if we start with clock speed, a clock, as we should know, well, hopefully we've covered this before. If you haven't, there are GCSE videos you can watch on this subject. I'll probably put a link to it. But what we need to know to start with is that a clock in the control unit controls the speed that the CPU carries out the fetch, decode, execute cycle. This is measured in hertz, usually megahertz, which is millions of hertz, and gigahertz, which is billions of hertz. And we call this the clock frequency of the CPU. So obviously one hertz is equivalent to one cycle per second. One gigahertz is equivalent to one billion cycles per second. You might also hear people talking about megahertz and kilohertz, but usually for CPU performance, gigahertz is the one that we're going to use the most because computers do perform calculations so quickly. Increasing the clock frequency means that more instructions can be processed in the same amount of time. And this is something that we call overclocking. So some CPUs let you raise the clock frequency. And that means it can do more instructions in the same amount of time. However, increasing the clock speed usually involves increasing the heat generated. To overclock a CPU, usually you have to raise the voltage. This raises the resistance. It produces more heat. If a CPU gets too hot, it can start crashing. Uh, you could burn out the CPU. You can cause all kinds of problems if the CPU goes beyond its kind of maximum temperature. So we generally use equipment like, say, for example, a heat sink and a fan to dissipate the extra heat. So if you take your desktop apart, you'll find out your CPU will have some sort of mechanism for removing heat, usually heat sink and fan. But as you increase the speed, it becomes hotter and hotter, and maybe the default heat sink and fan that comes with it isn't good enough at removing this excess heat. So the CPU could be damaged unless you employ a better cooling solution. So, for example, this is a fairly standard heat sink and fan combination here. Uh, the heat sink is on the bottom. And that just allows the heat to dissipate. And we've got the fan on the top to help push air through it or suck air away from it in some way to help the cooling of the machine. Of course, if you're doing some serious overclocking, you're going to be looking at something like this. Water cooling, maybe even oil cooling, just to really remove as much heat as possible. Generally, water cooling is more effective than air cooling. And if you're really overclocking it, you have to employ more technical solution, something that's a bit more advanced. Let's take a look at cache memory. So we know that the memory data register, the MDR, only holds one instruction. We also know that fetching data from RAM, from memory, is slow. Remember, we called that the von Neumann bottleneck in a previous video. So we have sort of kind of something in between our registers and our RAM. We have something called cache. Cache is a small amount of very fast memory built into the CPU. So it's larger than the registers, but much smaller than the RAM, and it's built onto the CPU. It holds instructions or data that are frequently used, have recently been used, or are about to be used, so that they can be fed into the CPU and processed and calculated very quickly. However, cache memory is expensive. That's why we don't just have lots and lots of cache. We still need to use RAM. You've also got the problem that larger cache becomes slower to operate. 
Therefore, on modern processors, we often have three levels of cache. So you can see here we've got the CPU and the registers. And maybe on that CPU, we're going to have level one cache, which is really, really fast, but quite small. And then we're going to have a much larger level three cache, which is much slower. And we're going to have level two cache in the middle. And that's going to be a kind of combination of speed and size. And then, of course, we're also going to have our main memory as well. And the idea basically is you want to keep the instructions that you're using all the time, the data they're using frequently over here, and then gradually move things down through the caches. And when you're not going to need it for a little while, put it back in memory. But when something for memory is required, you want to move it up through the levels of cache. So it's in the level one cache, just there waiting and willing to get sent to the CPU to be processed. Okay, so on a modern CPU, you're often looking at your cache being divided into three levels. And these are usually all on board the CPU. So this is all part of the CPU. And then you've got the main memory, which is obviously connected through the different buses and is located on your motherboard. So when data is required, the smallest and therefore the fastest cache is checked first, followed by the next cache and so on, until eventually you get to the RAM to check that. Usually, if you're using a multi-core system, each core has its own level 1 and level 2 cache memory. Uh, usually, level 3 cache is shared across multiple cores within the CPU. Let's take a look at multiple cores. Well, first of all, what do I mean by a core? Well, a core is a complete processing unit. It has its own control unit, its own ALU, and its own registers, etc. Originally, back in the day, a CPU only had one core. So you had your CPU, it had one processing unit, one, CU, one control unit, one ALU, its own set of registers, etc. But nowadays, certainly in the last even 15 years, we have what we call dual quad hex octa core CPUs. So that means you have one chip one CPU, but it's divided into multiple cores. So here we have a four core CPU, and you can see we've got four processing units. Uh, same in the diagram below, we've got four processing units on one chip. So that's what I mean by multiple cores. One chip, one CPU that has multiple processing units. And that's one of the reasons why modern computers are much faster than old computers, even though the clock speed hasn't changed very much even in the last 10 or 15 years. Clock speed is similar, but because we're adding more cores, we're really having a big impact on the overall speed of our system. So when multitasking, different cores can run different applications. So you could have one core that's running your word processor, one core that's running your web browser, etc. What's really neat is that if you have multiple cores, then you can split a job between these cores. You can have what we call parallel processing. So if you're running a game or Photoshop or 3D rendering or some other kind of complicated problem, part of the work could be done by one core, part of the work could be done by another core, so on and so forth. You're splitting the job up between the cores. We'll take a big look at parallel processing in the next video because that's really important. But that's just kind of a brief description of why multiple cores are useful, because they allow multitasking and parallel processing. However, you have to be careful here. Four cores does not necessarily mean that a processor will work at four times the speed of a single core processor with the same clock frequency. So ideally, for example, a dual core, two core CPU, would be twice as powerful as a single core processor. However, this has been studied. I think it's called Amdahl's law, if you want to do some research. In practice, performance gains are likely to be around 50% in this situation. A dual core processor is likely to be about one and a half times as powerful as a single core processor. And this is simply because not every job can be parallel processed. You can't split every problem up and have one core working on half the problem and the other core working on the other half of the problem. There's a limit to how much you can parallel process. 
So the next thing is to look at a way of improving CPU efficiency, and it's what we call pipelining. So just to start with, I'll give you a kind of analogy, and then we'll explain how this relates to your CPU in a moment. So imagine you've got a group of three people making tea for everybody in the school. Person A pours, I don't know, a thousand cups of tea while all the others waiting. Then when person A is finishing pouring all those cups of tea, person B then pours a milk into a thousand cups while the other two wait. When he's finished pouring all those cups of milk, finally person C comes around and adds sugar to each of those thousand cups of tea. Is this efficient? Is this the best way of making tea for a thousand people? Well, hopefully you're shouting, no, it certainly isn't. It would be more efficient if they formed a production line. So if you look at the table here, you can see that first of all, person A pours the tea number one. When person A is finished pouring the tea, he passes the milk to person B to add the milk. Person A then is pouring T2 while person B is adding milk to the first cup of tea. Then once the milk is added, person C can then add the sugar to the first cup of tea. While that's happening, person B is adding milk to the second cup of tea and person A is pouring the third cup of tea and so on and so forth. And you can see that very quickly, Everybody is busy by step three. Everybody's busy. Step four, everybody's busy. It's just really just at the start that you've got a little inefficiency. And the rest of it, everybody's busy until all the cups of teas are formed. Well, cups of tea are poured, not formed. Okay. And this is what we call pipelining. Pipelining is used in modern processors. The idea is while one instruction is being executed, the next instruction is being decoded and the one after that is being fetched. So it's not fetch, then decode, then execute. You can actually run different stages at the same time with modern CPUs. So again, look at the table. First of all, you have to fetch instruction one. Then instruction one can be decoded. While instruction one is being decoded, instruction two can be fetched. And then once instruction one is being decoded, it can then be executed. While instruction one is being executed, instruction two is being decoded and instruction three is being fetched. And then so far, and then, oh, so you continue on and on and on, fetching more instructions, decoding and executing. So if you're simply just waiting and doing fetch, decode, execute, fetch, decode, execute, you can actually do different stages at the same time thanks to the way modern CPUs are designed. This is especially true on ARM processors, uh, what we call reduced instruction set ones. But we'll take a look at that a little bit more detail later on. So as long as the pipelines can be kept full, this is making maximum use of the CPU. So definition for pipelining the technique of fetching an instruction while the prior one is being decoded and the one before is being executed. And pipelining, again, is an example of parallel processing. Because it's a simple form of parallel processing, but again, we can't do two fetch cycles at the same time or two decode cycles, but we can do a fetch and decode at the same time or a fetch, decode, and execute at the same time, which makes better use of our CPU which allows our computers to run faster. There are issues, of course, with pipelining. Sometimes programs branch. They jump to out of sequence instructions. So pipelining is working best when we're just incrementing the program counter by one each time. We're doing the first line, then the second line, then the third instruction, fourth instruction, fifth instruction. You can build up that pipeline nicely and effectively. However, sometimes you're going to decode and execute an instruction, and that's actually going to say, don't do the next instruction, jump to somewhere completely different in the program. This means your pipeline controller has to predict this jump instruction in order to keep the pipeline full and working at maximum efficiency. If the controller makes a mistake, the pipelines have to be emptied, what we call flushed, and this degrades the performance because we have to build up that pipeline all over again. 
In the example below, when instruction 2 is executed, it branches to instruction 9 as the result of a condition. In this case, we have to flush the pipes of the existing instructions. So it starts similar to before. Yeah, we can fetch instruction 1. Great. Decode instruction 1. Fetch instruction 2. Okay, let's execute instruction 1. Decode instruction 2. And fetch instruction 3. Okay, now we're finished with instruction 1. Let's execute instruction 2. Oh, there's a problem here. And that problem is that instruction 2 is saying, actually, I want you to fetch instruction number 9 and execute that. So that means we have to kind of start again. We're losing those gains. We have to flush everything out because we don't want, we don't care about instruction 3 anymore. We don't care about instruction 4 anymore. We have to start with instruction 9, decode it, execute it, and then build up that pipeline. So if the cache controller fails to predict this jump, and we do have this jump instruction, we have to flush the pipeline, start again, and we lose that performance benefit. Okay, let's just briefly summarize all of that and maybe look at a couple of new points just briefly. So hopefully we're familiar with clock speed. We can increase clock speed, but there's a limit to how fast you can overclock a system. You're gonna have stability and overheating issues. You're gonna to have to invest in better cooling, etc. Okay, we've got multi-core systems. Great, adding more cores can help speed up performance because we've got multitasking and parallel processing. But obviously that's gonna be more expensive for the CPU. And not all problems are benefit from parallel processing by having multi-cores. We have cache memory. So a greater cache memory means that the more instructions and data can be stored on the cache and you've got less possibility or you have to go to RAM less frequently to get draw new data in. So a larger cache can increase performance. But obviously you can't change the cache, that's determined by the manufacturer and obviously more cache is more expensive. So we're also going to look a little bit here just now at RAM size. Now, if you're using all of your RAM, if you're using very demanding applications and you're running out of physical RAM and maybe having to use virtual memory a lot, then increasing your RAM can speed up system performance, but only if you're running out of RAM frequently. You could also upgrade your graphics card. Graphics cards obviously are very good at dealing with graphical calculations. If you're running a lot of graphically intensive programs, graphics cards can improve your overall system performance. Of course, that's only in certain circumstances, of course. And we've had a kind of good look at pipelining. This is effective, but depends to some extent on the program actually running and the effectiveness of the pipeline controller to predict those branching jump instructions. Okay, so those are the main things we need to think about. As I say, clock speed, multi-core, cache, and pipelining are kind of the key ones. If you're in an exam and you need to think about, you know, maybe add an extra point or two, you can talk a little bit about RAM size and GPUs as a way of maybe improving system performance under certain circumstances, but the other ones are the most important. I'll be back in a week or two, and I'm going to take a close look at parallel processing, how it works, and what the different types of parallel processing are. This is an S1 Perry production. Please like, please subscribe, click the little ringing bell thing if you really feel like it. Good night, and good luck.